know quite what to uh, entitle the talk uh, because it really I'm talking about the way scientists approach uh, these kinds of issues and uh, EMF and DNA is what I ended up talking about. I could have said EMF and science, I could have said uh, EMF and biology, which is a little more focused, but it really, I'll, I'll bring it down to the level of EMF and DNA. It's that part of biology which I think is really essential to us as, a, as living beings and as a species, as, as human beings. Uh, uh, the next slide. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I start off with, with a quote, it's actually, I, I'm quoting, but the, it's something graduate, a professor mentioned in graduate school, one of his courses, and I put it down, it's, uh, um, mother, it's not there. Mother Nature guards her secrets well, but she never lies. And uh, actually, this is something that Albert Einstein said in a, in a talk about that, uh, Princeton back in 1921. But he said it in German, and the translation is not exact. But I think you get the idea that uh, Einstein was really summarizing the way scientists look at the world. They say, you can do science, and when you do it, you, it will hard, it'll be hard to extract the information sometimes. In fact, often it's very hard to extract the information. But when you get it, that's it. That's, good. That, I don't know what you want to call it. That's, a, that's really the last word in it. Now, things change in science. I mean, we, we started off with Newtonian mechanics thinking that was the be all and end all. And of course, quantum mechanics came in and re we realized that we didn't really quite understand everything about it how systems work, and we've now amended it. And so science is always the latest. It's not the really the last word. It's an ongoing effort. And we just have to keep probing to find out more and more. But what we find out is really, that's it. We have found it, and we can rely that that is on that as the latest, best information we have. So when people talk about proof, uh, it's, it's a funny kind of issue. Scientifically, you don't really talk about proof. You talk about the best information that we have at a particular time, and that information has been verified experimentally. Cells contain a lot of different components, and not every cell has everything in it. And as you know, there, there are long cells, like the nerves, which have long axons that make connections between different the parts of the body. But the parts, they all have some kind, I shouldn't really say all, I keep thinking of exceptions. I say they all have a nucleus. We know that one of the common, commonest cells we all come across, the red blood cell, has no nucleus in its mature form. It's ejected the nucleus. But most cells, virtually all cells, have a nucleus. And it's the nucleus that has the DNA. And the DNA is the uh, material that we shall focus on. The DNA, as we all know, is a long chemical. It's about six feet long inside us, and it's coiled up in two strands, the sugar phosphate strand, the sugar units connected by phosphates to other sugar units, and the two strands are joined by chemicals called bases. And the bases are links that hold the two pieces together, and these two pieces are twisted so that they end up making a helix. Uh, and we all know the double helix from the uh, Watson book and the Watson and Crick work. Uh, that was based on the uh, experimental studies of Rosalind Franklin, who uh, was not awarded by the Nobel Prize, but she had, uh, unfortunately, she had died, probably of uh, results of exposure to radiation, which was part of her, her work, her research work. But anyway, the double helix is something that we know uh, is, uh, is the basic structure of this molecule, and the links between the two strands actually are part of a code. The bases, as they're called, are tell the body which amino acids to put together when they make a protein. And so if you play games with the DNA and you change any of the bases, or you take a link out, or you break the chain, you are affecting the code. And that's why it's very important that the code remain intact. The second point I have here is uh, that it's Something we know that is passed on from generation to generation uh, in order to transmit the characteristics, the human characteristics, so that's why children look like parents in most cases. Uh, the, but 
People seldom focus on the day-to-day -day kinds of things that DNA does. It is involved in protein synthesis. Protein synthesis is what keeps our bodies functioning. In other words, cells have to keep making proteins to replace those that are damaged, those that have to be made. In, the, in other words, when, you're, uh, when you eat something and you have to get enzymes into the, into the gut to digest the food stuff, you've got to make more, more material. You've got to make more you know, pepsin and trypsin and these kinds of things so that they will digest the stuff. And the way you make it is the DNA will come apart and start making these particular proteins. And if you make, uh, if you have any damage that's done to the DNA, the, uh, this has to be repaired as well, and, and more proteins are made in that process as well. Now, DNA damage can lead to cancer after many years, and that's the part that we are always focused on. And we will see that that's the part that's really very important for a, an individual. And when you get too much damage, it can lead to something permanent, the permanent damage being called a mutation. Now, mutations are bad for individuals, but they're not fatal in most cases because the damage is something that is uh, lost when that particular cell dies. Cells are replaced. They become senescent, and the body gets rid of them. And you get new cells when the uh, good cells divide. But damage is <coughs> devastating frequently to uh, the species because if you get damage in a germ cell, that damage is transmitted to the next generation, and the generation is born with all kinds of bad things. And that's the part that we have to guard against. And people who worry about the damage to germ cells are really telling you that it's damage not to the individual so much as the damage to the species. Now this is a picture of, of the DNA, and you see it's not the DNA molecule as a chemist would look at it, which is basically a long string. You see, it's two meters long. It has three billion of these base pairs, and these base pairs are the parts that contain the information, uh, the code. But the thing about this, the, the, the DNA in the nucleus, is that it has a particular structure, and it is coiled. We started off with the helix, and these little lines between the two parts of the helix are the bases that have this code in it. And it starts off as a twist. But then to pack it into this very small area in the nucleus, you have to keep coiling it. So you get a, this helix is then coiled. And then the coil itself becomes like a fiber, and that gets coiled. And you have coiled coils, and you keep on having this thing so that it's finally packed together in a very, very small body. The interesting thing about the coiled coil is that this allows the structure to respond to many different lengths. I'm going to talk about the DNA as a kind of antenna. Uh, antennas that tune in to uh, different signals that are transmitted in, in the atmosphere are designed of, of particular length. Uh, if, if you remember when TV uh, came in, some of you may remember that, they used to have two different antennas, uh, two different metal bars. Uh, they had a long one and then they had a smaller one on top. They were for the two different frequency ranges because each frequency has an optimal absorption. I mean, each length has an optimal absorption for a particular frequency. Well, it turns out that the uh, coiling allows different uh, lengths of the DNA to tune in to different frequencies that are being transmitted, or at least that's the way it appears to me. Because the DNA is not an inert molecule. Those little lines that I showed you at the bottom of this slide are really chemicals that have electrons distributed at their faces. So that when you have the two strings together and these links between the two strings, you have real like sheets of electrons in there. And these are uh, electrons that are uh, delocalized. In other words, they're not really locked into a chemical bond. They form like a, uh, like a cloud, an electron cloud. In fact, they're referred to as pi electrons. The electrons that will make a bond, let's say, in a hydrogen molecule between the two nuclei, uh, that's, those are, are uh, sp special electrons that are locked in between the two nuclei. But the thing is, these pi electrons form what has been referred to in the literature as a pi wave. In other words, they can actually be a conduit 
and people have shown that these electrons can conduct. So you see this DNA structure has something in it that has the properties of a viable antenna. They can react to the signals that are being uh, that they're sensitive to, and they can react, because of the coil structure, they can react to a whole variety of different frequencies. Now, one of the things that has been uh, reported, and it's been reported by many labs, is that EMF can break up DNA. This is a report down in the very uh, weakest range. This is the ELF range, the power frequency range, reported by Lay and Singh uh, back in 1997. They showed that the, uh, if you take a nucleus and you uh, try and move it in an electric field, you can see that there are little bits and pieces that come off it after exposure to EMF. So if you look in the, uh, the first A, the first the screen there, you see that at that particular, in the control, you get little bits and pieces that are off and uh, normally from the handling that they will break off. But then if you go to the right of that, you see that more come off when it's exposed to a uh, one gauss uh, exposure. This, by the way, is the level that is considered standard. Uh, you have to protect to this level where there are protections in, in, uh, in place. One gauss is the normal safety standard. So you see, even at that level, you get this kind of damage. And the same is true you, as you increase the strength of the field, you get more and more damage. The other thing that one finds in, in the, uh, with DNA is that there's a reaction. This is work that we did at Columbia. I say we, uh, my colleague, uh, Reba Goodman, uh, and I have been working together for many years. And this is one of the things that we found. This is a review article in a specialized journal called Cell Stress and Chaperones, uh, where we reviewed the earliest work on this uh, problem. And we showed that when cells are exposed to very weak signals, comparable, actually much less than uh, in the previous slide, uh, Henry Lai and, and Narendra Singh showed with the, uh, with the breaking up of pieces from the nucleus, very, very low values, this is in the milligauss range, actually a few milligauss, you use something like five to eight milligauss, you can get these, uh, the activation of the stress response. The stress response is described as a situation where the DNA is made to come apart so that the you can read the code and the code is read in the body and the particular proteins are there. These are stress proteins. There are about 20 different ones in uh, nature and the fact is that we followed one and found the particular DNA configuration at the level of the promoter that is involved in reacting to the EMF that uh, is in the environment. This stress response occurs with a variety of harmful stimuli. It was first identified in response to heat. Cells cannot tolerate <coughs> excessive heat. We, you know, are uh, uh, homeotherms that we will be, uh, have to be at a constant temperature and uh, the cells function at best at that level. And uh, this is true of many cells. And if you raise the temperature, you find that these stress proteins are made. So the first identification of this stuff was as something called heat shock. Uh, that was the way this process was called. But we find that cells react not only to heat, they react to uh, uh, changes in acidity. If you go away from neutrality, uh, they react to uh, uh, Toxic metals, cadmium is one of the things that's used to induce it. Uh, they react to alcohol, you may be interested to find out. And those of you who caught the program on the uh, PBS, uh, they're running a thing about prohibition, <coughs> where uh, alcohol is, is considered a moral kind of hazard. It's actually a biological hazard. If you get too much, you will get the stress proteins synthesized, indicating that your cells don't like that. It interferes with a lot of action, normal actions in the body. The stress response, and this is the last point I have on this slide, is that it differs from the normal way in which we use the word stress. When people talk about the body being stressed, we think about things like people getting scared, they start running places, you know. Fear, for example, is something that will make you, uh, but that's not the kind of stress we're talking about. That's the stress that will lead to the uh, release of adrenaline, Cortisol, these are the, uh, the 
hormones that will get you to uh, fight or flee. Those are the, uh, the kinds of uh, reactions that one uh, gets to systemic stress. I'm talking about cellular stress. It's the cellular stress response that tells you that the cells are being harmed. And that's what we get uh, with exposure to EMF. Now I've talked about the, uh, these two reactions and these uh, that cause uh, changes in the DNA, activation of the DNA. And one of the things is that uh, they can actually damage the DNA. They can cause mutations that are similar to the ones caused by chemicals and radiation. But the fact is that when the DNA opens up and comes together again, it, it's made proteins in the process. And these, all these actors, acts that are going on at the molecular level don't always function 100%. We're not perfect, and so you get errors that creep in. Now, in protein synthesis, the error rate may be one in a billion, but it may be, if it's a critical protein, that billion may be very important, and it may lead to some kind of uh, malfunction. So that mutations uh, can occur also in repair genes. And I have a reference down on the slide of a study that showed that these repair genes, mutations in repair genes, are correlated with the incidence of leukemia in children. Children who have imperfect repair genes cannot repair the damage that normal uh, children uh, can, and they have a higher risk of uh, leukemia. So that was a, a very important paper that came out of uh, China uh, a couple of years ago. Now, the repair mechanisms are not always 100% uh, efficient, as you might expect. And you get what are known as DNA deletions, that is whole sections of the DNA can come out. And sometimes you get sections coming, coming back in or coming back in at a different place. And all of these things lead to damage that can show up in uh, later life as, uh, as uh, cancer. We know this, that uh, this is true uh, from experiments that have been done with twins. Now twins, as you know, are identical copies. I'm talking about identical twins. They, they have the same DNA. The egg splits, the fertilized egg splits, and you get two individuals that have the same genome. The fact is that as you measure, if you measure the DNA after a number of years, you find they're not identical. Because they're just the ordinary business of living will cause, there'll, there'll be some changes, and they have found that. And the other thing they have been studies on is autism, and, uh, comparing autism between children and parents, and they find in those cases they, uh, there are enough differences to let you know that these uh, DNA, uh, DNA repair is going on all the time and that it's not always 100% efficient. Let me give you this background of what's going on with the DNA all the time and the fact that it has all these properties of being able to react in different uh, lengths we say, we just published a paper last year uh, saying that DNA acts as an antenna. Now, we're, in custom, we're accustomed to antennas being long pieces of wire, but an antenna is something that can conduct electricity or that is respond to electric, uh, electric or electromagnetic signals in the environment, but uh, can also, uh, uh, has these two uh, properties, being a conductor and responding to different uh, frequencies in the, in the environment. And it's the different coil sizes that allow these differences, uh, the response to a lot of these different differences. And uh, the last point I have on this slide is that this greater reactivity range means that DNA can be damaged by a wide range of frequencies. This is an important practical conclusion because it means that whenever you set up a safety standard, the safety standard is always tested at a particular frequency. And you say, well, this will be safe at this level. But you're not exposed to that level only. You're always exposed to all the things that are around. And everybody's focused on smart meters or cell phones. But well, we've got the power frequency around us all the time. We've got TVs and RF uh, frequencies coming out with, with transmission uh, all the time. Uh, I've talked to uh, high school classes. I go in with my little portable Sony that has 15 bands on it that can pick up shortwave and radio frequency and FM and all that. 
and I can tune in, get a signal on each one of them. The power comes from the batteries that I put in there, but it picks up the signal that's coming out through the atmosphere, and I'm tuning into it with this little device. Well, our bodies are picking up the signals that are around as well, and we have the energy to do things in response to those signals, because we have our own batteries inside us that are giving us the energy to do that. So I have here a summary, a uh, kind of uh, checklist of the kinds of experiments that have been done that indicate the ranges in which these two particular effects that I uh, concentrated on, the heat, heat shock that's in the upper uh, part, the red, the reaction with DNA, HSP are heat shock proteins, the changes that occur with uh, heat shock, and also the DNA breaks that occur. And you see there are check marks next to all of the major uh, groupings on the uh, EM spectrum. And the one in the middle on cell phones and Wi-Fi, you see is also checked. So people have shown that these things occur uh, at the, across the EM spectrum. And this, I think, to me, is an indication of the property that are referred to as a fractal antenna. And this occurs when uh, engineers make antennas that can cover a wide range. This is a, uh, a indicative of a special property, and our DNA apparently meets these criteria. Now, we published this paper this uh, past year, and uh, not everybody's happy with it. And I, uh, I, there was a rebuttal that came out, and I actually, I thought it was a terrible one, and I, uh, I told the editor not to publish it. And so the man cleaned up the paper, and uh, he actually he responded to the, you know, some of the points that I made, and he sent in another letter. And I read it, and it still didn't, it wasn't, I didn't think it was worth publishing, but the editor thought it would be a good idea. So he asked me, uh, he said, would you mind if I published it and with your rebuttal? So I said, well, sometimes controversy is useful in science. It might highlight an issue, and so it will appear in, in the uh, International Journal of Radiation Biology. So you will see the, uh, I don't know, it will be, it will be published there. Uh, the uh, rebuttal is uh, edit. You'll see from my my uh, rejoinder, my response to the uh, rebuttal that uh, I still think it's without merit, but the fact is it will appear. So far, I've concentrated on the DNA stuff, and I think, as you can see, there's a lot of information there. To me, the information is very strong. I, I haven't gone into other stuff which, uh, which we've done. We found effects on enzyme rates, very important enzymes, uh, the sodium potassium ATPase, which is the basic enzyme that pumps ions across the cell membrane and uh, is responsible for building up a membrane potential that allows cells to function, allow nerves and muscles to function. Uh, we, uh, also, we showed the magnetic fields can affect uh, the cytochrome oxidase, which is a vital enzyme in mitochondria that allows these cells to build up ATP so they can do their work. That's the basic fuel in uh, biochemical reactions. Uh, that, we've published that. That's in the literature, but I haven't focused on that. What I've done is mainly show you about the DNA. But there have been many other studies that have been done that show that there's damage to nerve, there's damage to nerves, damage in, in sperm cells, uh, there's radio frequency broadcasting increases the risk of cancer, uh, cell phones increase the risk of uh, uh, brain tumors and salivary gland tumors, and there are increases in leukemia, Alzheimer's, and neurological diseases, the last point having to do primarily with the uh, lower frequency radio. Here's the RF broadcast, and this is a study that was published online uh, a while back by uh, uh, Neil Cherry, which shows the incidence of cancer uh, on, on the, uh, in this region uh, in San Francisco. And this is over a long period of time from 1937 to 1988. These are data that are in the literature. And these are, uh, in many ways, it's the kind of study that was done, uh, that was published by Sam Miller. In, uh, on dirty electricity, he just got the information that was in the records. Nobody went out and set up a study and got cases and controls and all that. 
they just saw what the death rate was uh, in the region of people who, children who live in the region of uh, Supra Tower. And they found that, as you can see, there's a fall off of the incidence, the risk ratio, RR is risk ratio, of, expo of developing cancer as you go further and further away from the antenna. Now, if you look at the, uh, the point at three kilometers from the antenna, it's about two miles away, you get, they, they measured what the actual uh, intensity was. And the intensity of that point was uh, one microwatt per square centimeter. Now, this is a thousand times lower than the rate that is considered safe. The safety standard is set at a thousand microwatts per square centimeter. And these data were, uh, for a distance of three kilometers, is, is at one microwatt per square centimeter. And the risk ratio was still five. That's a pretty high risk ratio in epidemiology studies. Now, uh, this is, a, I think, a very strong indication that just living in the vicinity of a uh, RF broadcasting system uh, is, c constitutes an added risk. And it should give everybody pause when they talk about what's going on with cell phones, because you're getting this all the time you're in that vicinity, whether you use a cell phone or not. Now, there's a recent study that came out with uh, uh, just this year in uh, uh, Brazil in Belo Horizonte. And uh, they did a study of all cancers in that particular town or city. Uh, and they found that it was those living within 500 meters of antennas uh, have a, a much higher mortality rate. They compared the, uh, the 500, within 500 meters to those living outside that radius. Now, the safety limits that they have in Brazil are set at two different frequencies. But in Porto Alegre, which is uh, uh, in the same vicinity, the same state in Brazil, they have actually lowered the level to 4.2 microwatts per centimeter squared. They have recognized that the, uh, there is a problem associated with this kind of uh, uh, tower, exposure to tower uh, radiation, and they tried to lower it. But as you can see from the list below, it's uh, not as low as some of the other places that have set limits on the kind of uh, intensities that are being allowed. The lowest, of course, is set in Salzburg, in Austria. And that the, uh, Salzburg set the uh, level at a point that was recommended by the uh, Bioinitiative Report, which I'll come to briefly in a little while. This is another uh, paper that came out this year. Uh, this is a study from Israel where they initially showed the effects on uh, salivary gland tumors. Now, salivary gland is uh, located just where you put your phone. It's the uh, secrete saliva into the oral cavity when, uh, when you're eating. And there are a whole bunch of different salivary glands. And this study showed that when you measure the, not measure, they collected the data for the incidence of salivary gland tumors when they compared the tumors in two different areas. One area is the normal parotid gland, which is located above the mandible, and the other is the submandibular gland, which is located below the mandible, the mandible being the jawbone. And the thing is that if you are below the jawbone, the gland is protected by the bone density so that it doesn't get quite the radiation that the uh, other one gets. And you can see the submandibular stays pretty constant uh, with, with the introduction of uh, cell phones, but the other one goes up, and it's going, keeps on going up, and leads most people to be very pessimistic about what's apt to happen with the uh, passage of time and the increased use of devices. Now, just a brief word about power frequency in disease. Uh, I haven't focused on this. This used to be old stuff, but the, uh, the fact is people have known for a long time that it's an increase in the risk with uh, leukemia, with exposure, and the exposure is at very low levels, three to four milligauss. That's very, very low. Uh, the uh, repair gene I already mentioned. Study in Switzerland has shown the al that Alzheimer's increases for people who live uh, within 50 meters of a power line. 
this is a huge study that was, I say huge, because it encompasses a large percentage of the population of Switzerland. And the fact is that they have this uh, enormous increase that shows not only an increase, but has the characteristic that epidemiologists like to find, which is a dose response. So if you have a, a five year, a measure of the effects of five years exposure, compared to 10 years, it goes up. And then at 15 years, it goes up still further. And at 15 years, living within 50 meters of the uh, power, of the power lines, you, you double the rate of Alzheimer's in the population. So that's a pretty clear indication epidemiologically that there is a great risk. Uh, breast cancer is another point that uh, is huge uh, research on that, but a you know, huge controversy as well. I mentioned a paper by Roberti uh, who found at the cellular level that there is an indication that uh, EMF at the low frequency can affect the activity of breast cancer cells. And uh, it, it can actually not only affect the activity, but it can, if you use an inhibitor, which is amoxifen, that's been used in cases uh, of breast cancer to, to uh, decrease the uh, recurrence of breast cancer, when you expose the, uh, these breast cells with tamoxifen to an uh, electromagnetic field, you overcome the inhibition that's due to tamoxifen and the breast cancer cells grow. So that it's, a, it's a double hazard. That is, it may induce breast cancer, but it can also uh, affect the therapy that's being used to inhibit the growth of the breast cancer. And the last point that I have here is the point about the Millen board, which is what I mentioned earlier, where he has shown that with the introduction of electricity in the US in the land of the 20th century, he collected data from different parts of the country and compared urban regions to rural regions where the uh, electrification uh, occurred in the different areas. <coughs> compared the north to the south, and uh, it showed that when, with electrification, there was an increase in cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, and suicide. You may say that these are numbers but these are numbers that were not manipulated. They were collected by people who were just writing down, like Jack Webb used to say on the television, just the facts, ma'am. These are just the facts. They put them down without any hypothesis and without any uh, agenda. And he just looked at them and said that this is the way, this is the way it turns out. And this kind of study, by the way, is more in keeping with what epidemiology started out to be. If one takes a look at the very first epidemiology study, there's a great book that's out called The Ghost Map. I don't know how many of you have read it. It deals with the epidemiology study, well, with the study that was done by Dr. Snow in London, the cholera outbreak in 1865. And he showed the, where the cases were, that uh, where the cholera cases were showing up in the Soho region of London. And he made a map of it which is where the book gets its title. And the thing about the map is that it focused on you know, right around the Broad Street pump, the water pump, which is where people were getting their water from. And he just said, well, I do something about it. And he did. He just removed the handle so nobody could use it. He didn't get any permission from the uh, authorities. And by the way, the authorities believed that it wasn't uh, it took, I think it was about 20 years later that people finally realized the germ theory was affected, it meant something. And at the time, everybody thought that cholera was due to a miasma, foul air in the atmosphere. So he wasn't operating on any theory, but he did the first epidemiology study, and he was convinced enough to actually take action. And he did the action, and the cholera abated. But nobody gave him credit at the time, and I think uh, he wasn't given any credit. I, don't, I think he may have died before the germ theory was set. But anyway, this is the kind of study that Sam Millen has done in the spirit of what epidemiology started out to be, and he's done it in a way that makes it, uh, that, that really gets interesting material that is both important and that can be acted on. But let me just say, that EMF, from a scientific point of view, is a health risk, and you see the exclamation point on there. There are biological mechanisms. 
people say there are no mechanisms. There are many mechanisms. The very first mechanism, by the way, uh, was pointed out by one of the earliest studies that were done in, in the 1970s, where they showed the leakage of a blood-brain barrier. This is work by Alan Fry that uh, uh, was overlooked, in effect, showed that just exposing the head caused the leakage to cause, and recently was shown that this results in death of certain brain cells. There are epidemiology studies, some of which I've shown you. And the important thing, I think, is the third point here, that the safety standards do not protect. They're based on the energy and the energy of a EMF uh, wave, and the fact is that the energy is unimportant. Apparently, it goes to uh, EMF of cold uh, energies. That the energies increase as you increase the frequency in the spectrum, and we find that these kinds of biological effects are uh, across the spectrum. We must limit exposure to EMF if we are to protect the population. And the last point I say there is that precautionary measures are needed. Precautionary measures are those that are taken when people are not entirely convinced, but they're cost-effective measures, like things that can be done at relatively little cost because the <coughs> The price you pay afterwards, <coughs> the damage that's done by not taking these measures, cannot be measured in dollars. Thank you.